I include myself with my trans brothers and sisters. We're in this battle together. The LGBT has got a T in there for a reason. They started our movement. They were, and it's not the time to desert them and kowtow to some primitive way of thinking. People have a right to live their lives in this free culture. And if that means uh, living a life as a trans person, because that's what makes sense to them, it doesn't matter that it doesn't make sense to you. It's their right to live that out. Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Christian Guru Murthy, and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. With me this week, the author Armistead Maupin, whose tales of the city have chronicled the lives of people in San Francisco since the 1970s. What started as a newspaper column that delighted in and dared to include gay, lesbian, trans and queer lives became novels and TV series and he's back with a new one, this time set in England, where he now lives, with the typically mischievous title, Mona of the Manor. Perhaps not an activist in the sense many of the guests on this podcast are, Armistead Maupin is a pioneer, writing about AIDS and HIV for a mass audience when few others were, poking fun at morality and social norms in a way that has touched millions over many years. Thank you very much for coming in. My pleasure. So uh, you brought San Francisco to the South of England. Yes, well, I, I, I've included uh, the South of England uh, in uh, earlier books, in a book I wrote 40 years ago. Uh, so it was natural to come back. And is that because you're living here now? Partially. This is home. I think I would have written this particular episode um, anyway, because I had neglected this character, Mona, and a lot of people complained about it, that they never got to see her um, at this crucial time of her life. So. I was happy to write about her again because I love her so much. And the basic idea is that Mona has moved here um, and they have some American house guests. Yes, that's the basic of this novel. It, you see it through the eyes of the Americans who arrive, who think they're getting a quaint old English manor house, which they are, but the, Mona's in it. And she lives there with her, her aboriginal uh, foster child who's gay and 26, and uh, they have a sort of what I call a logical family as opposed to, uh, you know, a biological family. Yeah, I mean, just explain what the logical family is. It's a, it's a family you choose. I guess. Yeah, it's, it's, it's chosen family. Just that was my term for it, and it seems to have caught on. Um, so many people live this way now, not just gay folks, but other people who, who realize that, that being loyal to... Uh, a, a biological family, if it's not working out, is a waste of time. And uh, it, it's, yeah, so that's what it means. But when did you decide being loyal to your biological family was a waste of time? Um, well, it's been a gradual process. <laughs> I have a brother that I've divorced about five years ago because he was too devout a follower of Donald Trump. We don't talk to each other anymore. And uh, uh, that's sad in many ways, but it's a waste of time if you're, particularly when you're my age, I'm almost 80. And uh, I want to have people in my life who love and support me and uh, know who I am, allow me to be who I am. Because you, you grew up in a conservative... To put it mildly, yeah. Racist. Racist. Um, sexist, sexist, homophobic family. Yeah, exactly. All those things, they all tend to come in a package. But, 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 you, but I mean, did you, have a, did you have an understanding that that was what it was when you were... No, I didn't. It? I was buying the package. That was just normal? Yeah. And it took me a while. I had to get to San Francisco to, to really toss that off me. But I, I wasn't questioning anything about my life. Fortunately, there were some good people there that uh, pointed me in the right direction. But for the first part of your life, I mean, until I'm mean, well into your 20s, you, you played the part. I did. That your family had. It, I'm ashamed to say it, really, because I did. Um, and, uh, and, and a lot of my attitude back then uh, was awful. What were you like? What was. I was who a, were you in your 20s? I, I was a, a, an apologist for white people for um, 
the, the whole conservative line, especially in the South, I embraced it because my father embraced it, and I wanted to be him to love me. I think that's the bottom line. I've asked myself why I did this, and he wasn't changing. He didn't change till the day he died. Jesse Helms, the, the famous uh, uh, homophobe of the Senate, uh, came to my father's funeral. They were friends. Yeah, they were friends. And uh, so, you know, I, for a while I learned, even when I, I was out, you know, I, I was publicly gay and famously gay, uh, he, we avoided the subject because he, I wanted him to still love me. And uh, he did, I think, love me, but I, I didn't like it on his terms. But how, how did you go from being a, the scion of the Southern conservative family to coming out? When I understood my own sexuality and my own um, need for love in a particular way, uh, everything changed. got better, everything changed. And was that something that, I mean, you talk about that as if it's something that just happened. I mean. No, it's been a while now. No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, I, I, no, I mean, I mean, discovering your sexuality as, as, as if, I mean, it kind of comes well, as a surprise. Well, I didn't come out until uh, I was 25. Yeah. And uh, for a long time, I just avoided the subject. I mean, I just stayed away from it and made all the noises that a straight boy would make. But it's a huge leap to go from discovering your sexuality, um, age 25, 55 years to ago. writing a book about it for 50 years well even to coming out in yeah. those days because that wasn't the norm that wasn't the normal reaction well i'm lucky because i was in a great place where there were a lot of civilized people both gay and straight who thought it was you know the, the fact that somebody was gay was not a relevant issue and so uh I, I was able to change really fast i was in a place where i felt protected where i was surrounded by my, my own brothers and sisters uh, and I could let it go. It just, it, it vanished because I stopped making myself be something that I wasn't. Let's go back to sort of San Francisco in the 70s then. I mean, I'll, I'll, can you conjure up an image of what it was you were living for a young generation having no real concept of what, of why San Francisco was so extraordinary in America? In the well, yeah, it was one, only one of the few places in the world where this was happening, but the streets were full of men and women who were openly gay, who would hold each other's hands when they walked down the street, who would kiss in public, um, who um, were leading their lives very proudly. And we were doing it partially because we had the support of each other and, uh, and partially because the, the straight population in San Francisco was very civilized. And um, it was an exhilarating time to be young it was, in, this was right before AIDS happened. I mean, not too far before it, but I had, a, I had was able to live without that terror for a few years and feel the joy of being in a place where you could be yourself and get on with life. How did you become a journalist? I, um, well, I did some reporting and that Tales of the City kind of grew out of that because I was, I, did, I proposed a serial to them that I would write every day. That's a hell of a commitment. Oh my God, it scared the hell out of me. <laughs> it really scared me. Um, but I had to do it and I did it. And some of those early chapters of tales were just straight out of, straight out of uh, the desperation of having to produce that copy. And were they the tales of the night before? Yes, often. In reality? Often, often. Uh, as the women who worked with me will testify, because I would come in and tell them some story about some adventure I had, and, and uh, it would go straight straight into the book. And people, various people have claimed to have been written up by you or be characters in your books. Yeah. I mean, do, do the people who, who you did write up, do they all know who they are? Oh, there are a couple that were sort of local celebrities. Uh, one of them was a woman that was a, a socialite uh, who... Uh, through through parties, big parties, and, and I wrote about her, and she came in and threatened to sue me, <laughs> but it was all the truth, you know, and uh, eventually a uh, time came when she wrote a book of her own, and on the cover it said, uh, as immortalized by Armistead Maupin in Tales of the City, 
she was bragging about it. And we're friends now. She's 90 something and and I still know her. I mean, I suppose you I mean you were writing a, you were a jobbing journalist, but, but it, this was also sort of entertainment, wasn't it, to some degree? Yeah. And, you know, it didn't, it, it didn't have a sort of a profound intent at the time, but it had a profound effect. Thank you. Uh, I, I, didn't, I was trying to entertain people, but I, I realized by taking this new subject matter, namely my life, um, that it did have that effect on other people who wanted to live their lives and be free. So um, it was wonderful. It was a great combination of elements for me as a, as a writer. I mean, it, 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 was, it, would have, it would have been other people who wanted to live like you, but also just the, the wider audience as well. Yeah. Because yeah. it very quickly became very popular. Yeah, it, 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 had, a, it had big straight readership. It was a, it was a newspaper. And uh, yeah. So what, why do you think that was? I mean, was it- Well, I, I made it addictive. <laughs> I fixed it so you- you had to come back to it because there was something hanging loose. I still do that. I did. But that. was it primarily about you know good good writing, good entertainment, or was it also that there's something about this subject matter, apart from the, like the prurient gospy interest, that people wanted to unpick, people wanted to think about? Yeah, I think they did. I think they wanted to hear somebody um, making matter of fact uh, a way of living uh, that was heretofore unknown to them. And I think because of my approach, which was a friendly one, uh, it caught on. How, how did people react at the time to the way you talked about sex, which is, which, as you say, is sort of blunt, matter of fact, descriptive? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, uh, it, they liked it. <laughs> Go figure. But how, but how did that compare to how people talked about sex at the time? I think it was quite different in that I was being matter of fact about it. And that's what stunned people. Well, I mean, was it a gay language that the straight world didn't see? Oh, they pretty much understood it. I mean, because I was writing about straight people as well. Uh, and everybody realized what the similarities there were in both worlds, you know? I mean, I, I'd read that you had a sort of a quota of gay to straight characters. I did. Was that I, right? They gave it to me at the newspaper. They said at no point... Um, should it rise above 30% of the general of population? Of gay characters. That was kind of generous, really, because it reflected what San Francisco is all about. But um, Were they worried? Or were they Oh, yeah, it? they were worried. And then they stopped being worried because the, the newspaper was selling like crazy. And, and they didn't want to kill the, the golden goose. I mean, um, were, were, was your newspaper and your editor, were they... Um, were they open and enlightened and no. San Francisco? Or were they... <laughs> <laughs> they were from an old San Francisco family. I, I know and like them, several of the current members. Um, but they were nervous about it, extremely nervous. And they would pick over everything I wrote every day to see what I was trying to say, you know. Uh, and sometimes it was just something as tame as one woman looking at another woman with a, in a loving way. Uh, they were, they were nervous about it. What what was the thing that what, what were the things that would cause most moral panic? The the gay people, the gay folks who were doing things. Uh, Whether it was or, men or, or women. Or the bath or... house, you know. Um, I wrote about that not in an explicit way, but I I took you through the bath house, uh, and um, and that made them nervous. So, so were you annoyed when they'd say, "Oh yeah, tone that down"? Or yeah, I was, take that and out? I didn't. Very often, didn't do it at all. Um, I tried not to do it. So, did you end up having a sense of crusade about? What oh you yeah, did? yeah, because this was at the height of Anita Bryant, who was the big homophobe in America, um, forming a, a coalition of people to fight gay people, and so I could address that. Uh, in Tales of the City, and I had a perfect way to do it because Michael Tolliver, my gay par uh, character, uh, was from Florida, and uh, his family was joining her crusade. So by showing the readers how ridiculous this was, um, I could get them on my side instantly. Of course, it wasn't that hard in San Francisco because nobody there was for that. But... Uh, I used it in any, any way I could. 
And, and, and how much of it was you at the time? A lot. Uh, a lot of the Michael chapters, the one involving the gay character, were, were me lifted from life. But many of the other ones were too. Mary Ann, Dee Dee, who's a socialite, whose fa family doesn't uh, approve of her. That was me. Um, so they were all different parts of you? Yeah. All different parts of me. And that's what I do anyway when I write. I try to find something in me that can make it seem true uh, to outsiders. I mean, and what about the mix, though, of characters? I mean, the, the, whole, the whole sort of, the, the, you know, the corridor, if you like, of, 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 of different characters. It's not just been, the, you know, gay characters. It's, it's gay, no, straight, I, I, trans, there were plenty, male, female. There were some books you know. then that were, that were uh, devoted, like, strictly to gay male characters, and I didn't want to do that. Why not? Because my life wasn't like that. Because I knew straight people, and they, we interacted with them, and we and uh, so, yeah. I followed my instincts as far as my own life was concerned, and I tried to involve everybody. From the very beginning, I realized that's what I had to do: make this about the world at large, and uh, stick with it. And how much of your own life did you reveal? I mean, the, the letter, the coming out letter. For the me. letter was very much my own letter. Um, that's in more tales. Uh, and it's, uh, Russell Tovey read it on stage the other night and brought tears to everybody's eyes. That was my letter to my parents. I mean, it was the, what I was telling them through that letter. Kind of a cowardly way for me to do it, but that's the way I did it. I, and I wrote it in Michael's voice. And uh, it's, it's survived for 50 years now because uh, people still have that to say to their families. Why, why do you think it was cowardly? Because I could have just said, this is me writing to you and this is my story, but I, I, I put it into a fictional character. But I could still express all the, all the you know, what I felt in that letter it still works for that reason. Well, that, well, that's what I was gonna say. How many of those letters are still being written, you think? So well, the they used to tell me, and maybe it's still happening, that they, you know, that they were um, cut, crossing out Michael's and they didn't even put in their own in to send to their parents. It became a template uh, for others. Well, that, that's why I ask you about how much has changed. You know, um, because because on the on the face of it, Britain is um, a different place. You know, and it changed massively in the '90s, I suppose, and the law has changed since, and middle class social attitudes have changed, and um, you know, we're we're in many ways an unrecognisable country in terms of attitudes towards gay rights. Um, but when people still have to write those letters to their parents. Yeah, it saddens me to think, on, a, on an individual basis, people have to write those letters, you know, have to, there's always some reason that your, your parents aren't understanding it or, or, or uh, putting up a resistance to it. Uh, it makes me sad when I hear young people write poignant letters about how they got thrown out of their house. And, uh, it's amazing to think that it still has to be, you still have work to do. You also wrote very early on, decades ago, about you know, well, one of your key characters is trans. Um, now, how do you feel about where we are now? I mean, isn't, isn't, that the, isn't that the bit of the story that hasn't changed and developed? Yeah, it is the bit, and it was really distressing to me. I was in an interview with a, a female journalist some years back who told me that uh, the, the Trans issue was a complicated one, I think is the way she put it. A lot of people differ on that subject. And I said, well, who differs on it? I don't, I don't understand anybody who would, can't grasp the concept that they're human beings and they deserve the rights that the rest of us have. And I discovered that there was a whole group of people here, many of whom call themselves feminists, who are opposed to, um, to trans rights. And uh, I address that issue in this book, in, this book. in Mona of the Manor. 
even though it's 30 years ago, because I knew that there could still be somebody who thought that way. And this was the way to point out that fact. So how, 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 how are you addressing it? What do you want to say? In that letter or in the... In the ab ab about that question, about trans rights that and the way trans people are... The LGBT treated. has got a T in there for a reason. They started our movement. They uh, and it's not the time to desert them and kowtow to some primitive way of thinking. Um, love is love. We've it's been said before many times, and and people have a right to live their lives in this free culture that we think is free um, to live their lives the way they choose. And if that means uh, living a life as a trans person because that's what makes sense to them. It doesn't matter that it doesn't make sense to you. It makes sense to them, and it's their right to live that out. And, wh and what about the question of what their rights are? You know, when they come to be defined in law and changing rooms and sports categories and all of it that. It always comes down to the, the bathroom, Toilets. doesn't it? Yeah. Toilets. It always does. When, when any, ever anybody wants to attack the rights of queers, it comes down to toilets. Um, I don't know what, to, I mean, I can't spell out what the law is gonna be, but uh, leave them alone, just leave us alone. I say us because I include myself with my trans brothers and sisters. We're in this battle together. And I'm, I won't consider myself, um, you know, placidly queer until that happens. And does it feel like a battle in the same way that gay rights were a battle yeah, in the 70s and 80s? Yeah, exactly the same way. Uh, they're getting killed because of, of this attitude. And we were too back then. We still are, as a matter of fact. Um, so it's, um, yeah, must fight for the right to live their lives the way they want to live their lives. It doesn't matter whether you are horrified by it or not. You've got to leave people alone. You, you also, you know, one of the early people to be writing about AIDS and HIV um, in fiction. Yeah, I was. I think I was the first. Right. And, and, and actually, the way, the way AIDS HIV is, is now being written about, sort of in retrospect, is, is quite different to how it was then. Well, I think people are realizing how much of the story was untold. So we get these marvelous things like It's a Sin um, that are trying to spell that out, exactly how difficult that was to have a family that wouldn't allow you to be who you are. Um, I think that these shows that are dealing with it now uh, remedy, trying to remedy something. That, I was trying to do that in Mona of the Manor with my AIDS contents in there. So to just explain what was, what, what was difficult about it? Just take us back to sort of, if you can, sort of what the challenge was of the time. Well, the challenge was to not have your family divorce you completely once they found out you were sick. It was to uh, not have the government uh, Ronald Reagan wouldn't say the word AIDS for years, uh, even though his wife was best friends with Rock Hudson, supposedly. I never heard him say that, but <laughs> um, the everything was wrong. You you were dying, and the and the prognosis was that everybody was going to die if you were HIV positive. Uh, back in those days, it was a death sentence. There wasn't, you know, the, the protocols that came along. And uh, you were dying and a terrible, painful death uh, alone many times because the family had left you. And that was a good time to be a San Franciscan because there were support to them. There were women, lesbians, who came forth to help their gay brothers. That's reflected in It's a Sin. Um, I, I love that. I love that show very much because it, you know Russell T. Davis uh, spelled it out. Yeah, really spelled it out. D did you feel frightened at the time when you were hearing those messages? Oh yeah, I mean I wasn't worried about my family. Um, 
but I remember thinking that I was going to get it any second now because I would have fevers and things that didn't seem right. You can talk yourself into anything. Um, I thought I was in pretty good shape compared to most, but um, uh, I was depressed to see that, that this thing we'd made so much progress on with was going to be dissembled by um, a disease and that it was going to, the, the, the wrong people were going to make the argument that this is why they don't deserve to live, you know, and they did. I mean, you, you mentioned Rock Hudson and you're, you're, you know, you're always sort of written up or talked of as the guy who outed Rock Hudson when he was, uh, when he announced that he was, was ill. But actually, isn't, isn't the more important bit of the story there that Rock Hudson was gay and that's the part I wanted thing. to share. Yeah. That's what I wanted to share. I didn't, didn't, I didn't out him in the sense of anything other than I said he's, everybody knows he's gay. Hollywood yeah. knows he's gay. Most of his friends know he was gay, and I will not be put into a position where we have to be ashamed of that. And thank heavens, he realized at the end, uh, he told his biographer to come speak to me first because I knew what was, I was, just at the right place at the right time in terms of my progress as a gay man to be able to help him out. And I did the best I could. Because how, I mean, wh how close were you? Were you, you know, were you, w would you describe yourself as? A friend. A friend. It, we were buddies in, you know, in the sense of, uh, well, how do I be, not be coy about that? We. We had rolled into hay a few times. Yeah. And um, uh, and he was the sweetest man in the world and drank too much. Had Everything was plaguing him because of his years in the closet. And having to do that in front of, you know, put on that show in front of Hollywood was, must have been awful for him. I know it was awful because he told me about it. That's what I was going to say. I mean, did he talk to you about that? Yeah, kind of yeah. Yeah. And, and what they did, you know, they would, if they went out together, he and his best friends, uh, they always went in a group of three because that didn't look like two couples. Uh, it would, you know, just be interpreted as businessmen because they had briefcases and a just preposterous uh, charade that they had to put on. Uh, and uh, those days are gone, largely. I mean, there's, there, there's some big time movie stars that are still keeping up the charade, but uh, for the most part, they're young actors now that are proud of themselves, and letting the world know who they are. But why do you think people are still living in secret? It's usually about money, because they think, you know, they won't be cast as James Bond, or <laughs> I'm, that's not, I'm not referring to somebody specifically. <laughs> But, um, but um, agents, managers, people who say, you know, you can't be seen with that person. If he's your boyfriend, don't be seen with him. That still goes on. And uh, the pressure comes from the industry itself. And most actors are not strong enough to withstand that. And I understand that. And it's quite, it's quite something and very flattering, I presume, for Rock Hudson to have told his biographer to come and talk to you first. Oh, very much so. He knew I would tell the truth and, and that I wouldn't do it in, in a hostile way. I was very moved when I heard that because I wasn't sure how I felt. I had, had dreams about him where he was forgiving me for it. And, and uh, I didn't have to listen to those dreams. I had, I had to listen to his biographer. I mean, it was quite surprising when you moved here, I think, from, from, San, from San Francisco. From San Francisco to Clapham, um, it's quite a move. No, it's not, really. <laughs> You've got a big green space there. We, we were just a block off the common, and um, I suppose it's big in some ways, but I've been coming to London for, since I was 19 to visit cousins and loved it, was always been captivated by it. Um, and still I am, just even though things are worse, the traffic and the, it's harder to live here. 
Um, but um, it's still a great adventure, and my husband wanted to do it. And uh, so we, we supported her, each other in that effort. And you, and you are now British as well? I'm now British. That's a hell of a journey, isn't it, from North Carolina via San Francisco? But I, I did it <laughs> via my grandmother, who was a suffragist. That's how old I am. My grandmother was a suffragist. <laughs> and um, I got in under her right because she was denied the right. To, she wasn't married to my grandfather. I didn't realize that until the 80s. Uh, and so when she moved to America, her children couldn't, didn't have, she couldn't pass on any rights to them. And so the current situation, as I understand it, was worked out so that I could come in as her grandson. And I love that. She was a great woman. I loved her very much, probably more than anybody in my family. And uh, she walked, fought for women's rights when she was a young woman. And, um, and so what if they weren't married? <laughs> so so, so how, how does being British now affect your sense of self or your identity, if at all? Well, I, you know, I wanted to be British when I was a little boy. I, I wanted to emphasize that side of my family as opposed to the Confederate side. Pretty good instinct on my part, I think. Um, and and uh, so it felt kind of like full circle, like I'd come home in a way. Um, it's, it almost felt like something I would have to do eventually. Now, this is the 10th book, isn't it? Yes. And that's it, is it? It's that's over. it. Now that, now that this has come back to Britain, I suppose the whole series has come home and it's done. So, so what's next? Um, how, how do you continue to write about yourself and the people around you? Oh, you'd be surprised. <laughs> I'm working with my husband, who's, who's researching it, on a story about um, a, a, an American writer who wrote it roughly the same time I did, 100 years before I was writing in the Chronicle. He was writing in the Chronicle. And he was, for the time, openly queer and traveled to Hawaii to, um, to look for love. And uh, it's a fascinating story. And, I, and I, wanna, I, I love the idea of writing about 19th century queer life because I've, God knows I've covered the other. And I don't want to pretend that I know anything about being young today. So I might as well be old tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and if you could change the world, how would you change it? Uh, people would be ruled by their hearts, by love. Um, I've learned to not trust that instinct, but I've st I still believe in it. Um, that would solve so many problems issues, so many issues, if they, people just learn to, um, to love and not judge others because of who they love. It's not just gay, but in, in a broader sense, uh, let love rule the day. It's hard to believe that could happen when this war is so much at hand right now, uh, but it's what we have to do. Armistead Morpin, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I've thank you for it. joining us on Way to Change the World.